Throughout history, man has exhibited infinite creativity in his ability to inflict pain on his fellow man. You can pierce or cut, you can stretch the body, you can compress the body, you can twist the body, which is where the word torture comes from. In our zeal to torture and punish, we have assaulted every body part, harnessed the laws of physics, and forced people to live in appalling conditions. If you treat people like animals, they will come out behaving like animals. And the bloody legacy of torture remains one of the darkest stains on human history. Increasingly, we're seeing torture being used all around the world and not simply in a few isolated countries or areas. Sifting through the remnants of where we've been and what we've done may tell us a great deal about who we are and why torture still exists to this day. Tonight, the rise of the prison system and man's enduring struggle to walk the fine line between humanity and abuse on the history of punishment and torture. Violence and torture were powerful tools of government in the ancient world. They were used to control the masses, force confessions, punish crimes, and justify religious persecution. But by the 17th century, the landscape of the world was changing. A mere 15 years after Guy Fawkes met his grisly end, attempting to combat religious intolerance, a boat called the Mayflower set sail from Southampton with a determined band of passengers in search of religious freedom of their own. The pilgrims landed in America with little more than the clothes on their backs and their unwavering faith in the Bible. In some ways, the colonists in Massachusetts in the 17th century were like shipwrecked sailors. London was really very far off and communication was difficult, so the colonies really ran their own show. They lived in very small settlements which were ruled basically by clergy and they didn't make much of a distinction or any distinction between sin and crime. The Puritans had successfully escaped what they believed was the decadent pageantry of Catholicism. In America, they were determined to create a legal system that controlled every facet of one's public and private life. They punished all kinds of behaviors that today we just feel are just your own business, including fornication, lying, and various forms of, uh, well, religious misdeeds, like failing to go to church or just simply being idle. This intense focus on a person's private life had both a religious and a practical origin. The population of Puritan America was small, so small it wouldn't fill a standard football stadium today. Therefore, every able body was crucial to the community and their lives were held under intense scrutiny. Even gossip was considered a punishable crime. A woman who blasphemed or talked too much, uh, she had one of those unusual bridles, a scold's bridle, uh, put over her head and uh, very often rather painfully uh, uh, pinned her tongue to her, her lip. So should she decide to go on scolding, it would lacerate her tongue. And in some cases, the bridle had a bell mounted on a spring above her head and she was pulled around the village by her husband by the chain which was attached to the bridle and the sounding of the bell would induce all her neighbors to come to the doors and salute her accordingly as she was dragged past <laughs> 
The ducking stool was a more elaborate punishment for women who nagged or spread gossip. The victim was strapped to a chair that was plunged into the local pond or river. When a person was punished, it wasn't just enough to punish them. They had to be seen to be punished. Justice was nothing if no one was aware of it. Pilgrim authorities were especially harsh in dealing with sexual indiscretions. Everyone knows about the famous scarlet letter that was worn. And in fact, this is not a myth. There was a scarlet letter, um, and there, uh, the, the colonial statutes prescribed that for certain crimes you could wear this letter, which in fact told people, well, you've committed this offense. So the person who committed adultery wore the A on her breast. A robber uh, had an R uh, uh, stamped either on his hand or uh, on his forehead, uh, and so on and so forth. The pilgrims believed that humiliation made the sinful sheep more eager to return to the flock. That's why all punishments were public. They were all done openly. Whipping, sitting in the stocks, whatever it was, was public. So that people could watch. It was a kind of drama, but not a drama for, the, for entertainment or high ratings, but in order to make a, teach a lesson, to show people this is what happens to you if you don't obey. Putting a criminal on public display created a need for restraining devices like the pillory and the stocks. The pillory was a device in which uh, the offender was uh, placed standing up uh, with the hands and the head uh, pinioned. Sometimes the ears were uh, nailed to the board uh, and uh, it was placed Originally, be up a, a high on a on a on a on a stage, you would say, and in the middle of the uh, the village square. And there he would stay, in full view of everyone, walking past or standing around, pointing, jeering, sneering at him. The stocks, which looked a little bit like the pillory, except the person sat down with their legs constrained in the uh, two boards that would be there to hold them. Both the pillory and the stocks had appeared in Britain over 500 years earlier, but reached their peak in popularity between the 16th and 18th centuries. Since the victim was unable to move, his experience could be relatively easy or very difficult, depending on the mood of the crowd. They could uh, throw rotten eggs or rotten vegetables or even stones. Uh, so it could be quite a dangerous uh, punishment that this person could have. Some people, in fact, were killed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, also, um, the villagers, if they uh, thought that this offender uh, deserved more uh, charity, you might say, they uh, threw uh, roses or flowers to them uh, to uh, send the message to the justice system. The idea of public shaming to maintain order has proven popular in many settings. In the British Navy, for instance, sailors were at the complete mercy of their captain, who enjoyed little influence from the outside world. Remember in the old days, there was no communication between the ships and Admiralty, or anything similar, and the captain was the total master of the ship. He could devise anything he wanted to. He was answerable to no man. One of the punishments was called marrying the boatswain's daughter. The man was laid across one of the ship's cannons in a particularly affectionate manner with his arms and his legs tied to the underside of the cannon. And then the lashes would descend on his defenseless back. And then the bosun's mate would step up, would get the cat, getting the cat out of the bag, if you like, and uh, lay on however many lashes, usually only 12. And then the bosun's mate, if it was more than 12, would be changed so a fresh mountain would take over. 
public punishment was effective in small towns or at sea, but the proliferation of larger cities demanded revolutionary new methods for maintaining law and order. As the population exploded in the 18th century, large cities experienced dramatic increases in crime. You have big port cities like Boston, Philadelphia, New York. They're full of people, sailors, immigrants, people coming and going. They develop uh, prostitution, gambling, vice, and so on. And they become very unruly. They're like London like little copies of London, unruly places with bad neighborhoods and a lot of urban unrest. One solution to this urban unrest was exile. Between 1607 and the end of the American War for Independence in 1776, over 50,000 prisoners had been banished by England to America. Then America wouldn't take them and then they were sent to Australia. Uh, so these created the large uh, penal colonies many of which became prisons of themselves. But this was the first idea of a large place that well organized the, a holding place uh, for a large number of convicts. The 17th and 18th centuries ushered in a time of great social upheaval on both sides of the Atlantic. The British Civil War, the American War of Independence, and the French Revolution permanently altered the dynamic between government and the common man. All over the Western world, you've got people challenging the power of, of the crown. And public punishment is seen as an opportunity for civil disorder. The, the large circus-like atmosphere of public hangings or public punishments were places where the populace could show their displeasure with the rulers. In addition, the scientific age was dawning. New discoveries established fundamental laws of physics, astronomy, and mathematics. In the 18th century, there was a change in the way people thought about time. Uh, under agrarian societies, time is something that is measured by the seasons or measured by the sun. But under capitalism, time becomes measured by the clock. And we think about time differently. Ben Franklin said it very succinctly when he said, time is money. When you think of time in those terms, then taking away someone's time as a punishment begins to make sense. Philosophers were eager to set up rules that applied equally to human beings. This led people to begin to question the source of criminal behavior. The idea was that people who got in trouble, who became burglars, for example, were people who had been ruined by bad society and by the, by the vices and temptations of city life. The development of mathematical probability theory led to a profound change in the courtroom. Probable guilt became acceptable for the very first time. Circumstantial evidence took on more weight and the need for confessions became increasingly unnecessary in civil law. This progressive leap forward helped crystallize an emerging distinction between humane punishment and what we now label as torture. Criminal punishment, uh, so-called, occurs after the finding of guilt uh, and is at the end stage, the very end stage of the process of justice, you might say. Whereas torture occurs very early. I guess another way of using the language uh, of punishment is to say Pain, when applied in the purposes of investigation, is torture. Pain applied for pursuit of um, uh, punishing a crime, if you want to put it that way, is punishment. All of these factors gave rise to the prison system that we know today. Today, people tend to take for granted the idea that if you're a burglar uh, and you're convicted, that you're sent to something called a prison that has cells and bars and walls. And I think people would be surprised to know that this is, um, historically speaking, an in invention of the 19th century. When we think of the modern prison, we're talking more about the way in which large numbers of people uh, 
convicts uh, were going to be organized and placed and held in a structure built specifically for that purpose. Throughout history, prisons were almost universally barbaric places. They were usually dismal torture chambers, dungeons or pits crawling with vermin, lice and disease. Early prisons mainly served as holding pens until a sentence could be executed. London's Newgate prison was originally built in 1130 as a lockup. Over the next 800 years, the prison was rebuilt three times after angry mobs burned it to the ground. No matter how often it was rebuilt, however, the conditions remained appalling. Imagine a large room filled with, with men, women, prostitutes, children, and alcohol. Uh, this was not the kind of atmosphere where people would go and get reformed or, or punished. In the beginning, prisons were bawdy, rowdy places. There were pigs, chickens, dogs roaming, um, entire families living together. And the reformers were concerned that, that people were simply time serving. They were not being educated by their experience and indeed were taking the time to inform younger residents of how to commit deeper, better, cleverer crimes. Prison life could be vastly improved with money. Those who could afford to bribe their jailers enjoyed considerable freedoms. The mixing of the sexes led to rampant promiscuity. Women who were condemned to hang actively sought to get pregnant so they could plead the belly and delay their sentence. Outbreaks of jail fever, a vicious form of typhoid, wiped out entire prison blocks in a matter of weeks. By 1759, it was estimated that one out of every four prisoners in England died in jail, far more than ever reached the gallows. It was this reputation that reformers faced as they struggled to improve the prison system. They tried to get rid of what they thought were cruel and barbaric practices from the past. And the ideas of the, the old brutal punishments were considered to be part of that, that barbaric past that they wanted to get rid of. So they were seeking a, a humane way to punish people. One of the most preeminent prison reformers, John Howard, suggested silence in prisons. As a young man, Howard had been captured by French pirates and imprisoned in France. After his return to England, he became a sheriff and a passionate advocate of prison reform. Howard pioneered the movement that prisoners should be penitent, hence the term penitentiary. Silence or solitary um, living would give prisoners time to reflect on their crimes, much as you would in a church or in a monastery. These are the ruins of Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Opened in 1820, Eastern was hailed as a breakthrough achievement in prison reform. Reformers in 18th century prisons saw crowding as, as the big problem with the jails. They felt if you could keep the inmates apart so they wouldn't be corrupted, that you could then reform them in the institutions. So separating convicts became the key idea in prison reform. Expanding on the work of John Howard, Eastern State emphasized silence, penitence, and complete solitude. So the modern idea of a prison is one that fulfills the function of constraint and hides these criminals away from the rest of us. If you left yourself for a bath or for medical treatment, they would cover your face with a mask so that no other inmate could see you and recognize you. They wanted to protect your identity so that you couldn't be stigmatized by incarceration. <laughs> 
Even Easton's architecture reflected the changing sentiment. From the rotunda, you have a perfect view down all seven cell blocks in the prison. A guard station there could keep an eye not only on the inmates, but on the other employees as they patrolled the blocks. This notion of observation was central to the prison, hearkening back to Jeremy Bentham, who believed that if you could always have people believing that they were being watched, then they would be well behaved and behave as you wanted them to do. In the 18th century, philosopher and architect Jeremy Bentham designed a circular structure he called the Panopticon. The Panopticon allowed an entire prison population to be virtually isolated from their fellow inmates while being watched at all times by guards. Easton's revolutionary design and method of treating prisoners quickly became popular in Britain. The Europeans fell in love with the elegance and simplicity of Eastern's design and philosophy, and they took it back and built prisons based on Eastern's design and implemented the solitary philosophy. For example, the Pentonville prison in London was based on John Haviland's design for Eastern. London's cold bath fields, House of Corrections, followed suit. All conversation between prisoners was banned in 1834. Even a whisper was cause for a severe flogging. And yet, with so much careful planning and good intent, prison officials were stunned to watch their reformation efforts go horribly wrong. From early on in Eastern's history, there were problems with the mental health of convicts and with the level of punishment. The um, code of silence, which went on in both British and American prisons, was of course a torture for the prisoners and sent many insane. But at Eastern, they felt that the spacious cells and the work that the inmates did would protect their mental health. They knew it was harsh, but they felt that the harshness was important because it would help the inmates confront the problems that faced them and thereby be reformed. And they felt that once they were, had confronted them, that the solitary would lose its, lose its terror and become something beneficial. At the height of its popularity, Easton was visited by the eminent British novelist and social critic, Charles Dickens. Dickens was probably the most famous critic of the system. He came to Eastern in 1842 and even though he was treated very well by the staff and the administration at the prison and spent a day touring the prison and interviewing inmates, he went home and wrote in his American notes about the terrors and the problems of solitary confinement at Eastern. With the mental health of its inmates rapidly deteriorating, Eastern soon resorted to many of the brutal tactics it had hoped to abolish. They would chain the inmate naked to the wall in his exercise yard and then dump buckets of water on his head from a, quite a large height. And one inmate went insane under this torture. It was done in the middle of winter and icicles formed all over his body. As the experiment at Easton spun out of control, a tragedy was inevitable. In 1833 and 34, there was a major scandal and investigation. The investigation was brought about because of the death of Mac Matthias McComsey, an inmate who died under treatment, as the report says, in the iron gag. The iron gag was an instrument uh, that had a, like a bridle and bit that had a metal tongue that would go into the mouth. Chains then went around behind your head and your hands were manacled and pulled up behind your back and attached to the chain that was attached to the bit. If you relaxed your arms so that they weren't painful, then the gag would be pulled back into your mouth, making it very hard to breathe. If you had your head so you could breathe, then your arms were in great pain. McComsey's death revealed a horrible truth. Torture was alive and well in the Age of Enlightenment. The prison system simply removed it from public view. Eastern Prison closed in 1971. Now abandoned and overgrown, it stands as a ghostly reminder to the tortured souls that suffered within its walls. <laughs>
noble attempt by prison reformers had failed to remove torture from society. In fact, they had succeeded only in providing torture a more fertile breeding ground in which to thrive. The failure of Eastern State Penitentiary proved that solitary confinement was not viable on a universal scale, but the concept of restricting freedom did work. Although early prison was conceived with the best of intentions, many people regard it today as torture in its own right. A judge today, for example, may sentence somebody to two years in prison. In actual fact, what he ought to say to that offender, uh, I'm sentencing you to two years in prison, and by the way, if you're handsome, you're going to get uh, probably raped. Uh, there's a very good chance you'll get HIV, uh, an excellent chance that you'll become a drug addict. Uh, by the way, also, the food uh, probably you're not going to like. Um, you're going to be constrained in many, many different ways. Certain kinds of imprisonment, such as very long-term solitary confinement, sensory deprivation, uh, or, or treatment of that kind in imprisonment, would be regarded by Amnesty International as tantamount to torture. Despite the trouble it caused at Eastern State, solitary confinement remains the worst punishment a prisoner today can be threatened with. Unfortunately, the lesson that solitary confinement causes insanity is not one that we learned well. Uh, the newest trend in prisons is the supermax prison, which are a modern day version of Eastern State. Developed in the 1980s, high security supermax fortresses use isolation and constant video surveillance to keep prisoners in line. All the walls are painted white, in which um, the person never sees another human being, in which their food is slipped through a slot, and lights are never turned off. Um, there is a history of people who are trapped in cells like this, of developing forms of insanity, and being so starved for sensation that they rip into their own flesh. There are those who argue that the legal process itself is psychological torture, citing the lengthy appeals process in the United States as one of the harshest ordeals man is forced to endure. Perhaps one of the greatest psychological tortures still existing today in the world is that of death row. Probably not considered by many people to be a torture, but of course people are waiting there for months and years to know the dates of their deaths, which is a heavy burden to bear. somebody being kept on death row for many years, being told they're about to be executed and then there's an appeal and then it goes on. And if that goes on for prolonged periods, that's also accepted internationally as being torture. The emergence of the penal system has been attacked from all sides. Some say it's not only bad for the prisoners, it has a negative effect on society. Perhaps the big price we paid for getting rid of what we like to call the barbaric and horrible physical punishments of the past is that we substituted in their place prison. Its very function is to take the whole idea and experience of punishment away from those who ought to be doing the punishing, that is to say, you and I, us, uh, and placed behind walls in secret. Author Graham Newman is an advocate of returning punishment to the people. By and large, the criminal punishments that we use today uh, have not been shown to be very effective in stopping people from doing crimes. And this, I think, is where we get into the idea that um, the more satisfying a punishment can be is one where we can participate in the punishment, uh, and uh, rather than a punishment that is done in some abstract, uh, distant 
way, such as prison, for example. Perhaps the darkest legacy of Eastern State was the realization that psychological torture could be just as debilitating as physical torture. Of course, psychological torture is hardly new. Thousands of years ago, the Chinese perfected the ability of using a single drop of water to slowly erode a person's sanity. And later, the inquisitors preyed on the frailty of the mind in order to gain false confessions. Over the centuries, interrogators have perfected numerous methods of breaking down their subjects. Where, for instance, um, you put a man in a black hood when you're interrogating him, you use a white electronic noise to disorientate his thought processes. Simpler, cruder methods used, certainly in the Middle East, put a bucket over a man's head and beat it with, a, uh, with truncheons. The most extreme form of psychological torture is known as brainwashing. Brainwashing is a term that we uh, use uh, in, in a very general sense. It really refers to um, interrogation techniques which are directed to making the victim un unsure of himself. Brainwashing could be facilitated in a variety of ways. By the use of drugs, perhaps, by uh, disorientating him, changing all the time so that what seems to be a 24-hour day may run 48 hours, may run 12 hours. He becomes, he, he, he becomes unconfident about his personality. And at that point, you can really begin to put other ideas into his head. That's what we call brainwashing. Solitary confinement, sensory deprivation, brainwashing. Horrible psychological abuses that completely erased the idealized notion of a place that would encourage reflection and penitence. If prison reform had been difficult, humanizing the death penalty would prove to be an even bigger challenge. The age of enlightenment, important breakthroughs in science and the proliferation of democracy had a profound effect on the nature of punishment in the Western world. The movement to treat criminals more humanely affected not only how they were punished, but ironically, how they were executed. Execution evolved out of the pomp and pageantry of the Roman Colosseum and the raucous frenzy of hangings at Tyburn Fields into a progressively solemn and secretive affair. Hanging was always done in public until the 19th century. In the 19th century, there was a revulsion against it because it seemed to be just too barbaric a spectacle. And then it was moved into the yard of the prison, but still lots of people could see it. The prison yard could hold a lot of people, and people would climb on roofs and climb trees to get a look at the show. As this public mindset towards execution shifted, executioners searched for more humane ways to put people to death. Back in 1792, the French guillotine had replaced beheading by axe or sword. Crude versions of the guillotine had existed for centuries, but a French doctor was able to persuade his government that a slow, agonizing death was inhumane. The guillotine's speed reduced the moment of death to a fraction of a second. It was hailed as a giant leap forward in the science of humane execution. 
Later, in the 1870s, a British executioner named William Marwood brought mathematics into the capital punishment equation with the invention of the long drop. And so he worked out a system whereby, de depending on the victim's weight, his age, his fitness, his development, his muscular strength, so the drop would be pre-designed, pre-calculated, anything between six feet and 10 feet. It had to be accurate. Too long a drop tore the head off. When he goes down into the pit, there would be the head some feet away from the blood pulsating from the body. If too short, strangulation was the result. The long drop was considered a more humane form of hanging since, ideally, it snapped the victim's neck instantly. Former executioner's assistant Frank McHugh explains the procedure in the documentary Hanging with Frank. This piece of the apparatus was used by the executioners to do their final adjustments to the rope to make sure that it was the exact drop that the executioner had decided according to the weight of the prisoner. 1,000 pounds divided by the stones and pounds gives the executioner to the nearest half inch. The executioners would mark a T mark across the centre of the trap door so that when the trap door is opened, they'd be dead centre and go straight down through the middle. After the execution day, the body would be left suspended for one hour. When the executioners would come back, he was re-examined again to prove that he was dead. Here in the UK, the long drop was employed as late as 1964. Less than three decades after the invention of the long drop, electricity was harnessed. This became the next quantum leap forward in expediting death. In response to hangings that were particularly cruel, the New York State Legislature commissioned the invention of a chair that would electrocute the victim. This was supposed to be a more humane method of killing people. but. And this is probably more important, it was also a much more private way, because now, instead of hanging in the yard of the prison, the execution took place in a room deep in the bowels of the prison with only a handful of witnesses. So now, for the first time, executions were truly private. This results in a very strange, contradictory view that people, ordinary people, have of prisons. You can talk to some people and they'll say, oh, they're just like a Holiday Inn. But others will say, oh, they must be terrible places. And I think that this speaks to some deeper emotion or feeling or gut reaction that people have. That on the one hand, uh, they want these people to be punished and very badly. But on the other hand, they feel guilty that this is done. In 1890, convicted murderer William Kemmler was sentenced to be the first man ever put to death by electrocution. Kemmler didn't take this lying down, so to speak. Uh, when he was sentenced and he faced the electric chair, he brought a lawsuit, went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, Kemmler's claim was that this was a cruel and unusual form of punishment, but the Supreme Court said no, and he was duly executed. The debate that ignited over the electric chair reflected the ever-changing values of society. Execution methods that one generation labeled humane, the next invariably labeled barbaric. The electric chair was a technological advance. It was supposed to be very humane, but in fact uh, there were a lot of complaints about the way it worked, people sizzling and frying. It burns and it causes immense shock and it floors the body and 
it, it is barbaric. It is particularly barbaric when it doesn't work immediately and successfully, and there are numerous occasions of when this has occurred, and a lot of these are very recent. The debate has been fueled by cases like this one. A radio documentary captures the exchange between Warden Ralph Kemp and Assistant Warden Willis Maribel as they witness the execution of Alpha Otis Stevens in Georgia in 1984. ordered a second series of jolts totaling 4,000 altogether, twice the amount required for killing a normal man. It took Alpha Otis Stevens 19 minutes to die. The drop in a gallow, the pull of a switch, and the drop of a blade. One could say that what all three of these forms of execution have in common is that they reduce the moment of execution down to a fraction of a second. And that's different than the long, excessive kinds of deaths that could happen under the old systems. You could call that modernization if you want, or an increasing level of sensitivity. This sensitivity increased the speed of executions. Lethal injection reduced the pain. For many, many years, it was understood that the death penalty ought to be conducted in as most painful a way as possible. Now, we reduce the pain in execution down to an absolute minimum, down to, these days in the United States, a lethal injection, which in effect is a, a needle prick. The interesting problem with lethal injection as a form of the capital punishment is that it seems to take away the essential element of the punishment itself, which is supposed to be the, inf the intentional infliction of uh, pain and suffering on the offender. This is the room where American terrorist Timothy McVeigh was executed by lethal injection for the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing that claimed the lives of 168 men, women and children. One can only wonder how uh, uh, family members or close relatives of a murder victim, for example, who uh, in some states uh, in the United States uh, are allowed to uh, watch the execution, uh, whether they can really be satisfied uh, in terms of retribution just seeing someone put to sleep. Should McVeigh have received a harsher punishment because his crimes were so heinous? Those in favour believe it's an easy option for the prisoner that he doesn't suffer enough. Those against believe it's such a quick, clean, sanitary method, although resulting in death just the same, um, that people are prepared to put up with it when if they were confronted with the reality of, say, a guillotine, they would be very much more against capital punishment. Recently, however, even the relative humanity of lethal injection has come under fire. Several witnesses testified that a tear welled up in Timothy McVeigh's eye after his final injection began filtering through his veins. Could it be that he was in excruciating pain? Some say this is indeed possible. The process of lethal injection involves three separate shots, a sedative, a paralyzing agent, and finally the lethal combination of chemicals. Some people believe that the sedative can wear off, 
causing intense pain when the final dose is administered, but the muscles are so completely immobilized that it's impossible to communicate. Since death is imminent, however, these claims are difficult to assess. Capital punishment had easily adapted to the confines of the modern world. Unfortunately, torture would prove to be just as resilient. The shocking fact is that there are more countries employing torture today than at any time in human history, as we'll discover next time on the history of punishment and torture. Next time will be the last time the history of punishment and torture concludes next Tuesday at 11.15. We'll stay with Five now for late night secret agent adventure with La Femme Nikita.